you can hear the recording that I left in my calculus class, but I went to the ER with my kid, and then I came home, and it was like 10.30, and then I drove here at like 11 to do sub plan. So about 11.22, I started recording notes for calculus, <laughs> and it's the saddest note you ever hear in your life because I'm just so tired, and I just kept yawning, and that's why no one else got recorded. Why was it 11.30? Why was it like your bed? Because I had to do sub plan. Oh, this is the downfall of teaching. Like, I don't want to... I don't want to leave busy work. Like I hate when I was a kid. I hated when I walked. In, I hated walking into a classroom and having this up because I would say, "Oh, we're just gonna do crap today that they're not even gonna grade. That means nothing. Like it was just a wasted day." But sometimes it doesn't get graded. I know. <laughs> sometimes you're like, "We'll just throw it out of the trash," and then you never even know, right? Like how do you know they'll grade all your stuff? Who knows, right? They do. I don't like that. So I try to leave good things. The good news is calculus was the only class that really couldn't just have like a worksheet. Like uh, solved algebra was in the review, so I didn't record. Sixth hour was in the worksheet since you guys were missing. Fourth hour I should have recorded, but I didn't. I just left the packet for them to try on their own. And algebra two is just Lucas, so I just left him my answer key so he could work on his test right there. Um, so what? Um, that's pretty good. Well, now one thirty six is like seven days. Of no, they have two days of review and two days of test. Review, review, test, test. Yeah, but why don't we get seven days? You don't. Because you're not a college class. What do you like to do? Some days we get two days review. Um, they get two days review because their tests are really long. Like, they have to take the test from Ivy Tech, and the Ivy Tech, their class periods are longer, and so that's why they get two days for their test also, because 48 minutes doesn't give them enough time to do the test. Oh, no. Kind of weird, but I talked to Instructor about it, and he thinks. How do we get it weighted? Like, we have to go to the school board and get it approved to be weighted for next year. But like this year, it can't get weighted. Like it's done this year. I did know that. If you live in this area, like you have to live in the same. Like I can't vote who's on our school board because I don't like you. You would vote on North Putnam's school board. You have to vote for the district. I live in Bay Ridge. if we can have one log equal to one log or if we have a log equal to number. But if you have logs added or subtracted, you cannot do anything until you put them together. So this is where the properties come into play. What can I do with adding two logs together? What can I do with those? Right? Multiply. Multiply. Addition of logs goes back to multiplication. So you have to know those properties. So we can say this is the same as log 2 of x times x plus 2. So remember that a log with an exponent, and when you add exponents, that's what you're multiplying. And if you have one log equal to one log, no addition or subtraction, then you can just forget about the log and solve uh, for the x's. And, and that's because we can really two both sides at this point, and then the logs just go away. But that's why the property says we can just now set this equal to this. If you forgot to put it back together and you did addition up here, you're going to have the wrong answer every time. So uh, really important that you recognize that to put it together first. And then I can say x times x plus 2 equals x plus 6. Oh my gosh, we get a quadratic. x squared plus 2x equals x plus 6. And I can subtract my x over. And subtract my 6 over. And get x squared plus x minus 6. So I was trying to use it a little bit. Yeah, we put it together, right? The properties say if you have log A of X plus log 
A and B, remember those three properties we went through? Addition of logs goes back together as multiplication. So I put these two together and to make one log, right? I took the X and the X plus two and I multiplied them together. Right. Where's the middle? The X plus two? So well, when you put it back together, it only makes one log. Like this property says this becomes log A of X times B. Questions on where I am to this point? Um, probably these should be factorable. Maybe not always. It could be a terrible one, but this one is factorable. What multiplies give me six, that subtracts to give me three. Uh, positive three, negative two. So I get x equals two and x equals negative three. But remember, when you're solving equations with logs, can you take a log of zero? Can you take a log of a negative number? Uh, no. Which means just like in square root equations, we can get those extraneous answers. So you do need to kind of check to see if your answer works, uh, especially when you get two answers. It seems like one of them usually doesn't work. Uh, and would you agree that negative three is not going to work into this problem? Because if I plug negative three up here, I'm going to get a negative number in my log. And I can't take that. It has that vertical asymptote. can't take log of a negative number. So two is your only answer. Go back to this problem. I, you might be wondering why is that number nine? Uh, because some some reason I thought I could do both of these days in one day at some point. Who thought I could do the same problems in one day? But then I had to stop and make it into two days, and I didn't remember them. So that's why I believe day one we stopped at number eight, maybe. But the good news is it's printed, so you don't have to get freaked out on your numbers. Okay, ready for the next one? The next one's kind of out of control. And I probably wouldn't expect that you would know how to do the next one without doing this example, which means on your homework tonight, it's probably one of these, and you should use this example to help you. <laughs> what could I do to this problem to make it look any better? So here's the, here's the struggle with this problem. Um, if we only have one 2 to the x, we could solve that really easily because we could ln both sides or we could log both sides. But we have a 2 to the x and a 2 to the negative x. We also have this subtraction here. I cannot put those together. And so we have to end up making this problem look a little worse before we can make it look better. And again, um, it's one of those problems that you probably would never come up with this step by yourself. Um, but Here's what we're going to do. We're going to multiply both sides by 2 to the x. So humor me for a minute. What did you do? It's, you can't do that because it's subtraction. Well, I mean, you could write it as 1 minus 1 over 2 to the x, but those are not going to help anything either. Just do this. No. Now remember our rules of exponents. What do we do with exponents when we multiply them? Add them. We add them. So what would 2 to the x times 2 to the x be? 2 to the 2x. 2 to the 2x. Two Minus, what would 2 to the x times 2 to the negative x be if I add those together? Zero. 2 to the 0, which we'll work out in a minute. And over here, you cannot take 2 to the x times 6 and tell me that that's 12 to the x. If you don't know what x is, you have to keep it. I'm going to write it as 6 times 2 to the x, or 2 to the x times 6, however you want to say it. So 2 to the 0 is 1, yes? 
Simplify a radical would be square root of 4 and square root of 10. So I get 6 plus or minus 2 radical 10 over 2. Can I do anything else? I can divide by 2 here. Not my square root. Can't divide something in the square root with something outside the square root. But I can divide the rest of this by 2 and get 3 plus or minus um, the square root of 2. That's what u equals, right? I don't care about u. I care about x. <laughs> oh, we're out of control today. This is what no sleep and your child almost dying has a So that's what u equals. So I'm going to sub back in. If u equals three plus or minus the square root of ten. We have to go back to say, what was u? u was 2 to the x. So I can say 2 to the x equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 10. Oh my gosh, it's the problem that never ends. I went down and then drew a line up and kept going. Look, mine's the same. Well, well mine's the x, but I went to the end and then I drew an arrow up. And then so, uh... There's really two different answers here, so let's think for a minute. Can 2 to the x ever give me a negative value here? No. So I just disregarded the negative answer because the square root of 10 is bigger than 3. And so I knew I couldn't get a negative, and if you tried to solve it, if you didn't realize it, you'll get undefined or domain error on your calculator. So I just said can't have a negative, so can't be negative. So now, how do I solve 2 to the x equals 3 plus the square root of 10? Ln both sides. And I get x ln of 2, because I can bring the x out front, equals the ln of 3 plus the square root of 10. And I'm almost done. All i got to do is divide ln of 2 over. So I get the ln of 3 plus the square root of 10 all over the ln of 2. Who thinks of such problems as well? I don't know. But who makes a good teacher? That's what I was about. Good teacher, that's what. Oh, so good teacher makes a good teacher. 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 Again, you got to be really careful with your parentheses. Ln, it starts a parenthesis. When I do a square root, it starts a parenthesis. So I end up closing two parentheses before I hit divide by ln of 2, and I got about 2.623 as my answer. Sometimes they make you do terrible problems because it's really like a whole lot of math in this problem. Um, you end up doing u substitution, you end up doing the quadratic formula, or doing the square, you end up having to be able to solve for a log, and think about if your answer is reasonable. So that's really the reason why they do it, but I agree, it's kind of a terrible problem. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of your homework tonight. So follow these steps.
super easy because it's a big fraction. So we got to think about, I got to get E by itself. So what should I do first? Multiply. Yeah, I need to get this out of the bottom. So step one is I'm just going to multiply this over to the other side. So we can rewrite that as 400 equals 150 times 1 plus 95 E to the negative 0.6X. And again, with math, there's always options. Some people don't like that there's options in math, but I don't want to tell you that you're restricted to doing only one thing uh, when if, if the math is true, it works both ways. You have two options at this point. One option is we could distribute this 150 in here. But for me, I think the best option is I just want to go ahead and divide the 150 over because it isn't the goal to get E by itself. So for me, I'm going to divide 150. First. If you want to distribute and not deal with that first you can, I don't care. Uh, but it just makes sense to me that I want to get E by itself. So I went ahead and divided that over. And I don't use decimals until the very end, especially if it's a repeating decimal. And I believe 40 over 15 is a repeating decimal. Um, so I don't care if you don't reduce it. At the end, you're going to type in your calculator. Um, hopefully, you can see right away that you can cancel the zeros out. Uh, you can reduce it if you want. You can not reduce it. It's not that bad. We can divide that by 5, and we can reduce that to 8 over 3. But if you left it at 40 over 15, that's better than rounding it to a decimal too early. All right? Because if you round too early, then it causes this round off error later. So try to not give me a decimal to the very end. And so then I just have 1 plus 9, 5, e to the negative 0.6x. And although this is a few steps compared to the last one, it's not that many. And it's not crazy stuff. I just need to get E by itself. So what would I do next? Subtract 1. And that would be 8 thirds minus 1 would be 5 thirds. And here's my advice to you. Because now what's the next step? What do we have to do? Divide by 95. And so I don't usually still type this in my calculator. I just leave it as, as a complex fraction. But if you're going to type it in your calculator, give me a lot of decimals. If I tell you to round the actual answer to three decimal places, go double that until you get to the end. Because if you round too early, especially if you round like one or two decimals, we are going to have a different answer. So if you want to type this in your calculator now because you don't want to keep 5 thirds divided by 95, um, I say minimum six decimals uh, if you're carrying two decimals. Okay? And the, or you can choose your fraction button, right? Yeah. I just left it like that on my paper because I hate using the calculator. Isn't that weird in math people? Yeah. <laughs> and I just wait till they get it. But yes, uh, if you use the fraction button, 5 thirds divided by 95, um, he said it works out to be like 1 over 152, which was enough. 1 over 52. There you go. 1 over 52. 1 over 152. 1 over 152. Gosh. Sorry. 1 over 152. We all got 1 over 152. I just read the wrong number. Now that I have this, what am I going to do to both sides? L in it, because that's how we get each sample out. So I have ln of 5 thirds over 95. And I always just automatically pull that out front. So now I'm going to have ln of each. Oh, I guess I can't out. Is negative 0.6x. So my last step is to divide by that. And now is the, the question, can we type this in our calculator correctly? Close your parentheses before you divide by 0.6, negative 0.6, and I got 6.738. That's definitely something that I could take on a test. That's just some good old logic. I really try to do an update with this next one because Newton's law of cooling is a really long formula and um, we didn't spend a lot of time for people writing it down. So I printed this out so that you could see this formula, uh, which is kind of a cool formula. It's not as cool as cooling. I wasn't really trying to make that joke. Uh, <laughs> in calculus.
us today we learned anti-derivatives and I said today we're going to learn what an anti-derivative is, although you might already be anti-derivative. <laughs> Uh, and Cora, you got cracked at lesson. She was only one at lesson today. Uh, you guys don't know the really well. It was funny. It was funny joke. Uh, but here we go. Newton's law cooling says an object that has been heated will cool to the temperature of the medium in which it is placed, such as the surrounding air or water. So, like, if you have something in the oven and you cook it to 350 degrees, when you take it out, whatever the temperature is in the room, there is a formula that will tell you in how many minutes how cool it would be. Isn't that kind of cool? No, you don't think that's a cool thing. Not that cool. Yeah, it's cool. But this is the formula. You don't have to memorize this formula. You just have to know what to plug in, just like the, the position and velocity stuff. So notice it has an E in it. That's why we're talking about it now. And it says for an appropriate value of K, where uh, the temperature T of the object at time T, oh my gosh, there's so many T's in this problem. Um, T sub M is the temperature of the surroundings. They use M because the medium. And T sub zero is the initial temperature of the object. Little t is the time, and k is some arbitrary value that either they will give us or we will find. Okay, so that's your formula. If you have anything to write that out, this is all we know. Now it tells you this. A cup of coffee has cooled from 92 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius after 12 minutes in a room at 22 degrees Celsius. How long will the cup take to cool to 30 degrees Celsius? We don't know Celsius very well. Riviera was like right over my job knowing what Celsius is. I would automatically have divided 70 over at the same time. So 
I get 28 over 70 equals e to the negative 12k. And again, you can reduce that fraction. I think it reduces to 2 fifths. And at the same time, I'm going to ln both sides and say that's ln of 2 fifths equals e to the negative 12k. And then, sorry, I'm just kidding, ln of e to the negative 12k. And I'm going to divide by negative 12. The exact value of k is ln of 2 fifths divided by negative 12. But because we have to plug that back in, a lot of people don't like leaving it like that. And that's where I say write a ton of decimals. So like on my paper, I wrote point, uh, 0.07635761, which means I wrote every decimal that I have in the Now, they, now you can take that and plug it back in and answer the question. Um, and it's just all about finding that k value. Questions on how I found that k value? Now the question says, how long will the cup take to cool 30 degrees Celsius? Which means now they want you to solve for time, which means you're going to have to L in again and plug it all in. But now you can plug in what k is. So now you're just going to change that 50 to a 30, right? 22 plus 92 minus 22. And now you're going to say e to the negative, I'm just going to say kt, and I'm going to remember that k was all those decimals. writing all those decimals in my paper, so I usually either leave it as uh, K, or I, on my paper I actually just wrote it as three decimals, but then I actually typed in all the big decimals when I typed it in. And again, just like the last one, it becomes very habit to do this. Divide by 70, KCLN, right? Like it almost, it's almost like adding by now. We've done it so many times. So I'm going to say 8 over 70 equals E to the negative 0 0.076T, LN, LN. And to solve for t, I should take the ln of 8 over 70 divided by that really big decimal, negative 0 0.07635 And I have an answer of 0.8.4 minutes. This is why exponential functions are important, because there really are a lot of formulas out there that use them. The last section in this chapter is about finance, and we're going to talk about all the ways that they teach these formulas in the finance world. Hold on, did I give you the assignment on here? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Goodbye.